to uh, WDYT. What do you think? We're going to ask you what you think tonight. <laughs> so uh, you've been following us. Uh, thank you. We don't, uh, and uh, I at least have known you the large part of my life. Yeah. Um, I'm an Arion. Right. And we got to work here together at La Sierra for many years. Right, right. Uh, anyway, so welcome to our little podcast. And we, uh, we have some me. questions. We're looking forward to hearing your thoughts on it. So you know Jim Brower too. I do. And uh, yeah. we're just going to have prayer and, and launch in. Good. Our dear Father in heaven, we just pray that you'll be with all who are choosing to, to watch this with us. To listen as three uh, older pastors, preachers, workers in the church wrestle with issues that have been uh, important to us. We love your church. We love ministry. And I just pray that you will guide us and uh, in a special way give Larry uh, freedom as he answers the questions that we are going to put in front of him. And may the program go where, where you would have us go. Bless each one as they watch. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I probably don't need to spend a lot of time on introduction, but I'm sure there's some people where we're sending this around the world that don't know. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were talking off here, grew up in China right? Uh, during the war and ended up in Beirut. Your father was president. Middle East College. Mm -hmm. Three different universities, colleges. Mm -hmm. A great man, as you know. I, I was going right. through my files as I'm weeding and here were a stack of letters from your father. You remember how he would type those, type those letters Absolutely. All good except one. I, I told one joke in church and he didn't like that. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> but uh, what a great man. Great man. Anyway, uh, I had you a Harvard, a Harvard doctorate in archaeology. Mm -hmm. uh, I had you at seminary teaching Old Testament. And then AUC president. Right. La Sierra president. Mm -hmm. uh, retired from there, community person, fundraiser for the university now. Right. LLBN president, mm -hmm. chair of the board. Mm -hmm. What else? That sounds enough to introduce me, I think. Enough. <laughs> and just to, to say, um, in our years together at La Sierra, Larry put his life into not only the university, but to the, to the community. And uh, I was at the farewell service in the community in one of our great halls here in Riverside. I think there were 1,200 people there as all cultures came together to, to honor Larry. So we are honored to have you here. Honor is mine to be with you. Yeah. Uh, I know that you were about 13 years older than I am, and I know what I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you've got eight decades pretty near that's right in the church right uh and we've been talking a little bit how we feel about the church mm -hmm. having watched the church been a leader of the church your father was a leader in the church how do you feel now do you feel good do you feel it's uh make, gonna make it it's doing well do you have some concerns that was our first question well uh I'm a product of the church from beginning to end. Uh, I love the church. I'm very grateful for the opportunities that the church has given me. And um, everything I am, I owe to my parents and to my church. So I love the church. I will always love the church. Um, and when I say the church, I would define it as the people. The church, if you know Fritz Guy, who we both do, you live across the street from him, emphasizes the fact that the church is the people. We are the church, yeah. not the people in Silver Spring. That's the hierarchy, but we are the church. And so, yes, I feel good about the church. I feel good about, uh, I feel good about my campus, my university church, my conference, my union. Um, I think that we're privileged to live and serve in a, a part of the field where basically we all get along. We love each other. We sometimes have differences, but we work those out. 
And I think that for the most part, we're tolerant and inclusive. Yeah. Um, not many people can say they have a female conference president, which I feel good about. Female senior pastor of our campus church. That's true, right? President of our university. That's right. Yeah. So uh, I think we try to exhibit inclusivity, including the leadership of females, and we're the better for it. Yeah. If we were talking about uh, the leadership in Silver Spring, I wouldn't feel as good about that. I think that there are a lot of good people there, but I think coercion and power and um, expectations on their part of how everybody should live and believe and do is uh, doesn't comport with fundamental belief number 14. I would hold them to that account. That's the one on unity? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember it was 13 and then they moved it up. So I have to remember. Right, that. right, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. I, I, I think I agree. Jim, you want to weigh in on that at all? Where do you think that the church deviated? Was it a conscious choice? Was it simply a uh, as postmodernism affected, there was a reaction to postmodernism. Why do you think we find ourselves now with the camps that we have? Well, I think it was by design on the part of certain leaders and lay, lay people um, who want to draw a circle that is smaller than that doesn't have room for everybody that is a Seventh-day Adventist. And um, it was studied on the part of leadership. They went about designing a tighter circle. And in order to be in this circle, there are certain things that you have to believe or you'll not be a part of the inner circle. And it's the same kind of tendencies that we experience in society and in, in, in our nation. You know, the, uh, we build walls to make sure that the people that are not like us can get in. And we, we have committees that uh, are supposed to um, make sure that we toe the line or otherwise we get punished. We get shamed in front of each other. Yeah. This is a story that's, I got to tell a, Jim real quick. We were on a bus in Jerusalem with Larry, with 48 pastors from New Zealand and here. And uh, we had a Jewish guide. Larry's our host. And uh, you know, I knew that Larry had lived a lot of his life doing archaeology in a Palestinian Arab country. And someone raised their hand and asked about the wall that goes right through where we were. You remember? Right, to Jerusalem. Driving at night, we had nothing else to do or see but listen to this conversation. And you had the mic in front of a Jewish guide who just said how much the wall made him feel safe. Mm -hmm. And someone said, Larry, how do you feel? <laughs> about the wall. I said, Larry's been in the Palestinian world. He doesn't want to offend a Jew. How is he going to get through this? Mm -hmm. You remember? I do. I do. And what did you say? Well, I don't specifically remember, but I know how I, 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 I would answer is that, uh, that while it protects the Israelis, it decimates the Palestinian society. It cuts them off from their fields, cuts them off from their uh, sources of income, and um, it uh, takes land that belongs to them, and it makes them feel like second-class citizens. That's it. What you said was, 
not only is that some of that too, but you, what you said yeah. was then, isn't it too bad that we have to have walls? Okay, yeah. And it's such a wise thing because how can anyone disagree with that? <laughs> yeah, right. But we do. Right. That's why we put up the walls. Yeah. Is that we think. There was a time when the, uh, the British and the Afrikaners were going to put a, a hedge or a moat. They were going to put a moat clear across the end of South Africa. Wow. So they could have the cape to themselves yeah. and have an island like England mm -hmm. down there. Mm -hmm. They couldn't afford the, the moat, so they put up uh, uh, bushes with thorns as far as they could. So mm -hmm. we can be over here by ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let me let me tighten this a little bit and see, you know, when I was young, there would be these speeches by the older pastors, older people in my family, sort of decrying, you know, the church is going to fall apart when the next generation comes in because they would look at us and say, you know, how is that generation going to going to do their part? Yeah. Now we are that old generation. Right. <laughs> How do you feel? Do you feel the church that we're handing off, the, the generation we're handing it off to is likely to finish the relay race of Hebrews 12? Uh, are you confident? Are you a little pessimistic? Well, again, it, uh, it depends on, um, on who we're talking about when we talk about the church and, and, who, and what we're talking about when we talk about belief and what is expected and so on. Um, I, I have to say that I admire uh, a lot of our young people today. They, they are a lot less um, um, how should I say um, they're, they're a lot more inclusive than we were growing up in this country. Um, you know, I, I grew up when I saw signs about blacks, you know, not, no, no, no Negroes or no coloreds. And um, I knew people back then and uh, who, who were on, who, who were black as well as, as brown. And the, the, the younger generation in California, at least, is a lot more inclusive. And it doesn't matter to them, you know, your background, your gender, your race, your class, and so on. And so I think that's all to the good. And they are, they are more, they're spiritually minded even though the standards, as we would call them growing up, are not as high, if you want to put, it, put them in those terms. But to me, they're more Christ-like than we were growing up, even though we uh, thought we were pretty much Christ-like, but it was based on what we believed rather than what, how we treated people. And if you read Matthew 25, the judgment is not based on what we believe, it's how we treat each other. Yes, yes. And I feel that the, today's generation are more spiritually minded, even though they don't read the Bible as much, maybe, maybe not even pray as much, I don't know. But they're kinder, more ready to forgive, more willing to be helpful, and um and are good-hearted so you're confident confident uh that the future is not less bright than it was for us let's put it that way even though it's different yes yes yeah, yes. yeah. Well, I keep thinking, you know, I've read John Ortberg and others. They said, 2,000 years, the light's never gone out. Right, right. And uh, somehow the next generation may change it, but they find their own way to, mm -hmm. to keep the kingdom of God going. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, well, I wonder <laughs> the current behind some of what you're talking about. You and I were in the middle of women's ordination. Right. Five years ago. 
you were older and uh, <laughs> I, I used to think, I don't have a Harvard PhD in archeology. span This is all I know how to do. <laughs> and there was a night, you remember, that I, oh, I just about melted down. Right. You know, I, right. I was being yelled at on both sides. Right. I have right. faculty on campus basically yelling, telling me I would never mount to anything here if I didn't come their way. Mm -hmm. I had church leaders who you know, <laughs> your right. board chair, right. yelled at me on the other side that I was going to lose my whole church and my ministry mm -hmm. for the sake of one word. Yeah. yeah. If I used the word commission, I was okay. And they would all come. If I used the word ordained, I was in trouble. Right. I'm 41, 42. I said, wow. I called you as a Larry, can I come up? <laughs> and you can let Jillian got out some lemon meringue pie and we talked it through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you do it all again? I would. I, um, I think that we did the, I know we did the right thing. You the know, stand of the local we, church. That's, that's all right. we had. That's right. We, we did what Jesus would want us to do. We were following his example. Um, he he stood up when he needed to for justice um and i i was encouraged by you and i hope hopefully um you know you were encouraged by me and together i think we stood for for what was right and i think that as a result a lot of young people are blessing the church i i remember when you know, before our, that experience, I went back to Sligo for, for the ordination service there. And when my board chair found out that I was going, he forbade me to go. Wow. And I said, Tom, I've been asked to introduce my sister-in-law, who's going to be ordained there. And I've agreed to do that, and I'm going. And I said, you're my boss. If that means I lose my job, so be it. But I have to do what's right. And I said, I realize that you're telling me what you have to tell me so that you can tell your colleagues. I spoke to him. I counseled with him. I labored with him. And this was a decision he made and not, not, not mine. I said, but I can tell you that I have a whole campus full of young people who are looking at us, wondering if we're going to be inclusive and let God call the people that he wants to call, or are we gonna make the decision, you know? So I said, if you want these thousand young people here to stay in the church, you're gonna let me go. And I'm going anyway. <laughs> so I had had it out with him before. So he, he, he knew what I was going to do, so I wasn't as worried. Uh, and, you know, to his credit, he never raised the issue again with me. You told me that. I not heard this part, but you told me that he came to you and said, pretty brave to go against your board chair, but you will yeah. never hear about it again. Yeah, yeah. But so I, I, I honored that. I mean, he, he did what he had to do. I did what I had to do, and then we just dropped it. You know? Yeah. yeah. I uh, didn't just look at the thousand kids. I looked at my two little boys. Yes, yes. And uh, I said, someday they're going to hear about this debate. Right. And they're going to be 20 years old and ask me, Dad, you were what, a pastor back then, you know? Yeah. <laughs> what did yeah. you do, Dad? Yeah. And sure enough, when we had the vote, you know, the one in the union, at, yeah. um, anyway, out there in San Fernando Valley somewhere. Right. I came home that night, and in this office, my two boys came out, sat here on the couch, mm -hmm. and asked me the whole thing. Yeah. The idea that we would discriminate based on a factor that no one had any choice about, yeah. was laughable to them, right. ludicrous to them. Right. And if I had blown that and wimped out on it, yeah. I had had to live with that for the rest of our life together. Yeah. So I, I was have, glad <laughs> that I stepped I, up. You know. I, I have a sister, I have a daughter, so I understand exactly, um, yeah. you know, how but, important uh, that is to them. Do you think it will become worldwide in our lifetime? Uh, at least in your lifetime, maybe, maybe not in <laughs> mine. <laughs> it'll, it'll, take, uh, uh, it'll take new leadership at the General Conference. Let's just, let's put it, you know, but it's inevitable. 
truth will win out someday, yeah. despite yeah. the people who are laggards. You know? I find as I travel around the world, the next generation of pastors and workers, as they are exposed to the world and read more, hear more, talk more, getting better educated, right. they're moving. Right. And right. Uh, I am hearing, maybe they say that because they're in front of me, but I think it's genuine. I, sure. I, I hear yeah. that move. Yeah. I, I, I heard a uh, female pastor ordained from China say that she was thankful for the political situation that does not allow the General Conference to rule over us in China. We obey the Lord instead of the GC. <laughs> good, good, good. Yes. Uh, to see if I can get a question in about, about our time at last year, but it has a broader implications, and Jim and I have talked about it. Uh -huh. There was a postmodernism undercurrent right. at last year. Mm -hmm. There may still be. I'm not as plugged in. I've been gone yeah. 11 years. Right. Uh, with the idea that it's arrogance to claim that you know truth, mm -hmm. that we're a university, we are pursuing truth wherever it goes. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> uh, there was argument about whether we could use the word evangelism, for example. Mm -hmm. The idea that you could claim that one package of beliefs was better than another was anathema to some people. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I found that a difficult time. Yeah, you and I navigated that the best we could. Mm -hmm. we we're progressive, but you and I were both loyal to the church mm -hmm. and trying to hold on to the university for the church and to mm -hmm. the kids and faculty. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that issue as it has spread through? I think young, many young pastors have a version of it. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I took a poll in my honors religion, world religion class a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. At the beginning of the class, 21 nothing. The idea that one idea was ultimately better than another was wrong. Mm. It's up to you, what you mm -hmm. prefer, mm -hmm. but not, talk about that for a minute. Yeah, I, I remember uh, the, that time and those discussions, and I would say that, um, that there's not the same agitation along those lines that I that I see or or hear now. You know, I think that that um, um, most of the faculty would say that there are uh, some important beliefs that are rock solid that uh, make us an Adventist institution. Um, and they're important to who we are. And if you don't feel comfortable with those, then this probably isn't the, the right place for you. But we're all tolerant of each other. And we feel that differences of opinion are good to be expressed on a campus where we do research and where we are trying to discover new truth and where we allow people to say new things and to share their thoughts because we learn from each other and we have to be uh, humble about our views because time has shown that we haven't always been right you know our forebears have not always been right and so um, you know we look back what are some of our forebears <laughs> thought were important and we can and we can say to how how could they have done that and so i have to ask myself today what am i doing or saying that the next generation is going to look back and say how could they be so benighted you know we should have another meeting on just that <laughs> so yeah i i think you know, I think there there's some some issues that uh, hold us together as Adventists that uh, that are pretty important, but um, I think there's also has to be toleration for for a lot of other views. And as long as we want to fellowship together, as long as we say that we want to support the Adventist mission. Uh, I, I have I don't hear any criticism of evangelism or sharing our faith anymore. Maybe I'm just not in the right right places, but it's certainly not not perfect. But uh, 
Yeah, I, I, I remember discussion of whether we should go out on our own. Do we need, you know, the Adventist church to be- Money from uh, the church and the control of the church. Right, under the control of the church. Oh. We, they're only giving us, you know, 10% uh, of our budget and uh, we, could, we could be on our own and make up for that 10% easily, you know, by, by, in other ways and still serve the church. But uh, I felt, I'm sure you felt, and I'm sure the current leadership feels that there's no reason for La Sierra to be uh, an institution if we're not an Adventist institution. That's what we were founded for. That's why people would come here. The, the nation doesn't need one more, you know, liberal arts institution that uh, doesn't take a stand on certain things. So um, I think that, I think that that uh, we're we're much more tolerant than our forebears probably were when it comes to to beliefs and what people think and what they do. That what we 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 don't police each other the way. <laughs> Is that a threat? Could 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 we be so tolerant? Yeah. That then there's nothing special about us. We're just one more church down the yellow pages or down the street on yeah. Church Road. And there's nothing that glues us together to say, I've got, I got good news to give the world. Right, right. Yeah, I think, I think, I think we have to walk uh, a median way, not, not uh, be so exclusive uh, that we're of no earthly good and not be so lax that we don't stand for something, you know. Well, somewhere to articulate that middle. And I felt like I was proud to be part of a discussion of us here because we could say we're a university. Right. We speak truth. We ask any yeah. question. Right. But we're also a faith-based institution, and we're proud of that. And right. we have an agenda. I stand in my business ethics class at the School of Business. And I'm, I'm not going to apologize. No. no? So we're going to talk about capitalism and these other functions of economics and values. We have an agenda. Right. So right. We want to be respectful. We will listen. We'll learn. We can grow. We're not perfect. Yeah. Right, but uh, I'm a follower of Jesus, and I will never apologize for that. Right. And and you know, I appreciated your pastoral leadership in that regard. I think I've told you before that I never ever left church after you preached without feeling better about God and myself. And that that doesn't that doesn't happen but everywhere, you know. Thank you. Thank so you. You entered in discussion, you listened, you argued, um, but uh, you know, you, you were a blessing to our, uh, our community. Yeah. It was one of the nicest things, which I treasure now on the wall in my office, when Randall Wisby gave me the picture of the statue of the prodigal son. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. And he said that, that what we had stood for in the church, I think you and I together, right? bracing, open, welcoming, grace. Right. But still, we're Adventist, right. and, and there's some rock solid cores that we're not going to give up here. Right. Uh, right. That meant a lot to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's let's maybe segue from that, Jim. Are you want to jump in anywhere here on the postmodernism uh, part of this? Uh, no, I would ask Larry a different question. That's okay. Okay, come back when you're ready. You may remember this, Larry. I knew you as professor, uh -huh. and then and then went away and came back. And now you had just got elected as the president of AUC. Ah, uh, yes. We had gone through the Ford and the, you know, all those controversies. Yeah. I was just falling in love with Hilda, just a young pastor feeling my way. We got there and they chose for the ministerial council to pump up the investigative judgment every single night. Yeah. Five nights in a row. Mm -hmm. and, and I was lost. I mean, I said, do, do I fit here? You know, do my, am I, I, I can preach some of this, but I can't do all of this. Yeah. I don't agree with all of that. And somehow there was a break in the meetings and I came down on the floor. <laughs> I usually wouldn't be allowed, but I got down on the main floor and you were there. Mm -hmm. And I got to go with you and I just was so proud that the church had room for you to be a president, I knew we were of similar, similar part of the church on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. 
And I told you my aunts. I just said, I don't know if I fix. Mm -hmm. I'm a vendor. I've got a hundred years in the church. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if there's room for me and who I am and all I can do in my conscience mm -hmm. in this church. Mm -hmm. And you said, if you leave, then that's what the church is. Mm -hmm. All of us leave who are not that, mm -hmm. then we leave the church to them. Mm -hmm. But if we stay, our voice and our role, we get the chance to be a part of that discussion. Yeah. A few years later, you and I were here together. <laughs> here. <laughs> Remember the night at the Spanish church? And you had just come back from Jordan. Uh huh. And a couple people chose to take last year on a lot. Oh, yes. Yeah. And uh, it got a little unpleasant. One guy was shooting his mouth over past me to you. I was sitting next to you. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it got heated, and I intervened, and I said, we'll do this later in your office, but we're not going to do this here. Uh -huh. Good for you. <laughs> and I walked out across the parking lot, and you said, when I meet people like that, I'm ready to just hand them the church. <laughs> That's what the church is going to be. They can have it. <laughs> and I had to say to you what you had said to me. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> if you leave, they win. Yeah, right. But would you would you say that to me now, thirty five years later? How how would you feel about that now? Yes, I. I as as I as I said uh, at the beginning, we are the church. You know, the, the church is the people, the people of God, not 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 the not the leaders, not, not the people in the hierarchy. They're useful for certain things but they don't make up the church, we make up the church. And so if the church is ours, then we make it what it is. And, um, and I think you and I both believe that there needs to be room for tolerance, different views. We, we've, we, we are certain of, of, uh, of the basics, but there are other things that we can disagree on that aren't part of the pillars. And, um, I don't think the investive, investigative judgment is one of the pillars, you know. I'm, I'm sure there are people who do, but post Ford, I don't know how we can, we can say that, you know. My mother went, was retired, my parents were retired at PUC when Ford did his, you know, lecture on the investigative judgment, 1979, yeah. And my, my parents went to his Sabbath school class every Sabbath. And my mother told me that for the first time in her life, and she was retired, she had assurance of salvation. You wow. know? What a compliment. Because she was, she was worried. Will I, will I be ready? You know, when the judgment falls, when my name comes up. She always worried about that. And her whole generation worried about that. And, and Ford cha changed that for a lot of people. And, and your uncle did also, of course, the, you know, Maury. Maury Bender. Yeah. So, um, so we've grown in that regard. And I, I, I think that the investigative judgment was something we came up with to justify what happened, you know, our disappointment. And God has uh, blessed us anyway, but it was a mistake. And we just have to say we made a mistake. You know, our forebears were, were knew they had something going and they were trying to figure it out. And so we don't need to perpetuate that mistake. We're glad for the fellowship. God um, raised us up in our disappointment and we're doing an important work and we have an important message for the world. It is not easy as a, an apologetic evangelist that goes all over the world preaching. Right. To use that, even, even if there's some truth to whatever happened there, to say you need to do this and this and this because of some event. Right. No one right. can see that happened almost 200 years ago. Right. And, and you, can't, uh, you can't explain it to make any sense. I, d I don't know of anybody who's, who's explained it well so that it, it encourages people, you know? <laughs> I sat down one time at Hinsdale when the Adventist Affirm came out with 150 pages. Mm -hmm. Remember a small group yeah. there, and I can tell you right. the name. Well, uh, so I thought I had an afternoon free, let me plow through this. And I got to seven, page 70, deep, deep into the math and all the... Right. <laughs> and I said to myself, 
how are the people in Mongolia going to get this yeah, they in don't. order to be saved? Oh. How are the people in the villages in Thailand, where I grew up, and right. go back and preach now, right. going to get this and understand it? The only way they can get the assurance of it is to believe in the archaeologists and the chronologists and the genealogists who, who came up with the dates. I have no expert expertise to do any right. of that. I have to take somebody's assurance for that. Right. And I just said, it may be true, but it cannot be critical. Right. Because right. too many people are never going to have a chance to understand right. this or have the capacity to be able to believe it. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't fight against it, and I'm willing to uh, accept something happened. But um, there's, I, don't, I don't know of any Adventist preachers on the Crusades that are putting it in their series anymore. No, no, no. I think, I think, I think you, what you say is right. It may be right, but it's not critical. So let's not waste our time with it. Yeah. Jim. So uh, let me shift gears a little bit because uh, while you were teaching at the seminary, mm -hmm. what I heard from you was that you were trying to figure out a way through archaeology, et cetera, to undergird, support scripture. Mm -hmm. The question I have for you is what would you do different knowing what has happened since mm -hmm. postmodernism yeah. and all the trends that have tended to wipe out an awful lot of respect for scripture. Right. And so I'd just be fascinated to hear what you would do differently as you tried to prepare a group of preachers to go out and preach yeah. differently. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I took all the courses at the seminary that Siegfried Horn taught because having grown up in the Middle East and actually traveled with him in the Middle East on his first trip, what, you know, that is to the Holy Land. I was living in Beirut as a teenager when he came through and he allowed me to go around with him. So it was a privilege and uh, helped him get the Heshbon dig started. And the reason that he chose that site, as you know, was because um, it's the first site where the Israelites take on uh, Sihon the Amorite king and fought him and uh, they, they took that city. And so he was interested in the dating of the Exodus. And he thought if we dig at that site, we'll find a layer that uh, will, you know, be that destruction. And so after we had been there a couple seasons, it became pretty evident that that layer wasn't there. And it was, it was really disappointing to him. And he, so disappointing that he, in a way, sort of lost some interest in the site. And he, so he turned it over to me. He also became the dean of the seminary, and so he had other things to do. But that was a blow to him. And so I fully, having been trained by him, um, I, I expected that we would find it. Um, and in, in fact, uh, I, was, I was in graduate school then, as we were beginning that dig. And so I came from Massachusetts to attend the excavation. And my first year at Harvard, I was assigned a seminar paper on the 13th century uh, Palestine, the archeology span of 13th century. Uh, knowing of course that my professor, Jernist Wright had published that that was his dating you know, of the conquest, the exodus and the conquest and so on. And so I, I felt like he was throwing down the gauntlet knowing where I came from, you know. The tradition of you is 15th century. Quite 15th century, right. So, so uh, Horn's, Horn's view and, the, and I would say that the evangelical, you know, conservative Christian view is an exodus uh, around 1450 and a conquest around 1400 you know, uh, give or take a few years. And um, whereas the, those who believe still in an exodus uh, of uh, Protestant Catholic uh, historians, and, and many don't anymore, but those who do would put the conquest around 1220, something like that. And uh, uh, the, the exodus, I should say, and the, um, the, the conquest 40 years after that. So I went into this study figuring that all the secondary literature and the dig reports and so on that I would find um, would support 
13th century because that's what my professor believed, you know. But as I studied all the site reports and all the archaeological data and so on, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't find any evidence that satisfied me that that's when it occurred. And so in a long excursus in a, in a footnote, I, I suggested an alternative view for the 15th century where I, I had discovered some things that could be used, you know. And the custom was that these papers would be put out to all the department faculty and students two weeks before the assigned day when they would be discussed so that everybody was supposed to read these. And the day that it came out, my colleagues came to me and said, Garrity, you've cooked your goose. I mean, you're, you're, you're taking the professor on. He's published on that. What do, you, what, do you, what do you think you're doing? Well, I said, I just, it's a footnote, you know. And I, yeah, I, you're right. I can't, can't find the evidence that he wants, but, you know, he'll, he'll uh, let's see what he says. Well, when the, he was the faculty critic that day. You know, the faculty took turns being a critic. And he, uh, I could tell he was very upset. My, my classmates brought coffee and donuts to the class, which they'd never done before, in order to have a con more convivial, you know, <laughs> attitude. They, they were really thinking that I was going to get uh, canned. And he, he, he didn't look me in the eye, and he argued from a, from a higher critical point of view, using biblical texts to undermine what I had said, but he didn't, he didn't deal with the archeology, span which was the main point. And I thought, now that's strange. He's the archeologist as well as a biblical scholar. Why, doesn't he, why didn't he deal with the archeology? span So he, he made room for a later Exodus by, you know, Jabin is both in Joshua 11 as the king of Hatzor, and then later in the judges, there's Jabin in the Deborah Barak story. So he, and I would say that's Jabin one and Jabin two. Maybe it's a it's a a name within the royal family. You know, just like there are many different Tutmosis and very different Amenhotep's and so on. But he said that, in a higher critical point of view, they made a mistake, and um, there's only one Jabin and so forth. So anyway, he he went he went through a long discussion like that, and I could tell he was very upset. It was on a Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon. I couldn't sleep that night. Thursday morning, I went in to make an appointment to see him. And he said, he said, Larry, he said, I'll never be able to speak as confidently about the 13th century Exodus and conquest again, you know. Oh, and you. he said, he said, I know, I know you're an Adventist. I know that you're, you're one of Horn students and so on. And he says, and I don't want to change that. Uh, I want you to be able to go to Andrews University and be a good teacher. But he said, this is what's important to me, that you know the data and that you're fair with them. And he says, if you know the data and you're fair, that's all, that's, that's all I would ask, you know. And then he ended our conversation saying, I'm looking for a teaching assistant next year. Would you be interested? Huh. Wow. How good is I that? mean, it blew me away. I went in expecting that I'd be washed out of the program. And so, so that taught me that there's some really good people in the world, you know? And I thought that was a sign of a really great man that he would put up, put up with. I want to push you a bit further because the values that undergird his respecting disagreement is what is critically missing in the church today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you speak more about that? What so I, I would say that, as, as, you've, as you've noted, I dedicated my life to archaeology. I've worked in the field for, for almost 50 years. And uh, now I would say that the value of my work is uh, learning about the context for the biblical story, and it illumines that biblical story. It's, it's not proof in the way that you often think about proof, 
but there are definite ties between what we find in the field and the biblical story. And so we understand the biblical story much better now. I mean, we talk about the drama of the ages and archeology span deals with the stage when that, where that drama took place. And we come up with the customs and the artifacts and the places that figure in, all, in that drama, you know? And we understand it better. We understand the customs and we understand words and, and so we can interpret scriptures better and so on. Um, but it's, a, it's more along those lines than proving the Bible true, you know? Is that what you're asking? Like the old book, the speed confirms the book. Right, you know, I would, I would never publish a book by that title. And I don't think Horn would by the end of his life either, even though that was his book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the issue that I'm getting at is because, uh, as you heard us talk about a little bit, my concern nowadays is for the younger generation to have the tools yeah. to do critical realism. Right, right. Okay? To look at the issues, not necessarily the spade confirms the book in a post right. in a modernistic sense. Right. Right. Or, uh, as your boss, and that's a great story, uh, sort of washes things out from a historical critical method. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we find and what are the tools by which we engage each other? We can disagree, but we also use the tools to find out what is critically real and important and can yeah. be used. Yeah. You know, I. I've I've come to think of of its of the authority of scripture. It's sort of like a, a tricycle. You've heard this before, I'm sure. The front wheel, the big wheel, is the scriptures and what they tell us. Uh, the two wheels in the back are um, are experience or tr tradition, you could call it, and reason. And we need both of those to make sure that our tricycle is moving along the way. You know, we, we, scripture is the foundation. We, we believe scripture. Uh, it's the one that guides us. It's the one where we get truth. But there's some hard sayings in scripture that you, you know, you've got to use your head to sort it out. And you also look at the documents of the church and the fundamental beliefs and the other things that have come out of the experience, you know, and, and, and those help you but it's primarily scripture that, uh, that, that guides us. But it, has, it does have to have interpretation, and we don't always know for sure the answers. But archaeology has helped us. This has nothing to do with our brand uh, subject here, except to say, uh, I have been with Larry to the dig place. Mm -hmm. so Larry. Larry just, you know, just came alive saying, I dug this here, and we just, you talked about crawling illegally under the tunnel where you weren't supposed to be. Right, right. You know, and he showed us the rolling stone tomb that he helped uh, discover, mm -hmm. some of that. But here's a story I like. I told this 50 times, Larry. We were standing at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre waiting to go in, and somehow we were delayed. We had a 30, 40 minutes. Larry says, you want to go over here to the museum or whatever that center is a couple blocks away? What's the name of that? Um, Asor or whatever that was there. Uh, I'm trying to think at the entrance to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre you're talking about. We went over a couple blocks away and it was an Oriental Research or a museum. Okay, yes, yes, there. yes, the okay. Albright Institute. Yeah. Albright. So, yeah. so Larry says, Dan, you want to go over there? Yeah, well, so did Sam Lenore and 10 yeah. other people. Mm -hmm. So we race over there. They don't know we're coming. Mm -hmm. Larry goes up to the little intercom there and he pushes it and he says, yes, this is Larry. And the gate opened. <laughs> <Just like that. laughs> we know his name on the other side of the world and the gates open. So we walk down the cement of this little sidewalk. The group is ahead. I'm back with Larry. We turn left. Here's a little planter, little white planter. Mm -hmm. And as we went by it, Larry said, I dug that out of the ground. <laughs> <laughs> that, was an, that was an ossuary from that the time of Jesus, a bone box. Yeah. Unbelievable. 
That was the that, fun. That, the that, that was the that was found in the same cemetery where the crucified man was found. That's in all the literature, you know, from Roman times. Yeah. Really. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> But I don't, know if I'm, I don't know if I'm answering, if I'm getting at what you were asking or not. Well, I, I was just asking what you would do different. That's okay. be the only part that you haven't really wrestled with, and that's fine, you don't have to. Just if what, that's what something you're consciously are aware of, that you would change this, so you would try and de-emphasize or emphasize. That's part of what happens as we go into retirement, as we look back and say, right. well, what would I do different? Yeah, yeah. Um, I wouldn't do a lot different, you know, I, I, I was fortunate to have Horn as a professor, uh, fortunate, fortunate to have Jernus Wright. One thing he told me in that conversation, he said, you know, Larry, when I was your age, I was, I, I stuck out because I believed in the Exodus. All my colleagues thought it didn't happen. They, 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 they didn't believe anymore, you know, in the Bible story. And I was conservative in my day. Now he says, you're conservative in your day, you know? So he, he recognized that there's growth as you go through, through life and we do make changes and we do think uh, new thoughts and we do some things differently. But I, I, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do, things too differently, Jim, you know, now in terms of archaeology and the Bible. Although uh, I started out with archaeology proves the Bible, but now I think it illumines the Bible. Uh, so that maybe is a little difference. Let me, I, I know we have to come to an end here pretty quick, but this is, this is important to me. Sure. You had, we had a famous archaeologist, I won't say the name, but you, I think you'll know who it is. Yeah. And we were all invited on Friday afternoon to meet up in the ad building in a big room there. Right. And he proceeded to talk. Mm -hmm. And I read articles, and he seems to be a giant in archaeology. Mm -hmm. But he proceeded to tell us that the stories of the Exodus and all of those things, as archaeology buried the Bible, is that him? Yeah. You see, you see his That's name? Him. William Deaver. <laughs> So, uh, that's, his, that's, that's his newest book. So I'll have to read. But as he said, you know, there's no evidence in the field for two million people heading across a desert or whatever. Right, right. So these are a few little scraggly families, clans running across the desert, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. That these stories are myths that gave Israel its history and its purpose and its bond but the historicity is not really true. Yeah. Uh, and as we walked out the door, I said, Larry, to be a smart person, do I have to believe that? <laughs> and you said, I don't. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe there are one or two stories that, that you know, are, are parables. I, I, I'm not trying to say no, but I believe Jonah and all those stories. Yeah. Is it possible to be an intellectual, honest person? Yeah. And still believe in the historicity of the great miracle stories and so on of the Bible. Sure, I, I do. Think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you know, the number of Israelites, Horn doubted that. He said it's impossible to have two or three million people in the desert do that. You know, it just, it just didn't happen. And he, he would get into trouble at the seminary among among the students and of my day. Word can be clan or a thousand or something like that? Yeah, yeah. In other words, that within the Bible text itself, there are hints that bring the numbers way down. Both the way you translate the word elif, which means thousand, or it can mean units, military units, you know. Um, so, so linguistically there are hints, and there's the counting of the, of the of the tribes and the Israel, of the 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 uh, Levites when they weren't going to get their own uh, uh, you know area geographical area, but they would count the heads of families and they would be made up for in a different way. I mean, it it doesn't fit millions of people in, in those figures and so on. So there 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 are ways to handle 
responsibly the numbers in the Bible without yeah, having to the have general them. outline be true. But yes, right, right. And yeah. I just have a hard time believing that Judaism developed from something that wasn't true, you know. I mean, it's just, it boggles the mind. And the, and archaeology has helped us there. I mean, within the Pentateuch, there are Egyptianisms, you know. Some, some group came out of Egypt. There's just, in my view, no question about that, you know. Well, otherwise, otherwise we end up, our religion is, is the beauty and the beast and Cinderella. Right. Right. That right. have meaning and purpose and three little pig. These are stories that have meaning and teaching. Right. Yeah. Who to say, you know, it, it is our religion is rooted in its history. Yeah, it and is. He just rose from a grave, died and rose, and he was a real person, and this really happened. Right. Uh, anyway. That's how that's why Judaism and Christianity are different from so many of the Eastern religions. You know, it is based on history. Yeah. The, the, I've talked to people in India who, who don't care if the Ramayana is fake. Right, right, right. It doesn't matter. And they're comfortable with that. Yeah, right. But our store, ours is rooted in those stories and that it happened. Right. And that it can be repeated again at the mm -hmm. second coming. Right. Uh, to wrap it up, any, any highlights you would say? You look at the 80 years and say, that was really good. I just want to finish with something here. What, <laughs> if you, that was, that was a special time or a special event. Well, you, you know, it has been satisfying to have a career in the, in the church, to be able to teach at the seminary, and then um, where I expected to be the rest of my life, but then was asked, you know, to, to take on these administrative responsibilities. And that has its own uh, satisfactions where you can create a environment in which other people can succeed, you know, where young people can can find faith and where the faculty can do their work and where they can publish and so on. And so it was satisfying. When I went to AUC, there were 300 students. And when I left, there was 900 students. It was a small place, but we had a really going concern and it was successful, I believe. Um, built a, a, a new building there that uh, that they used right up until the end. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you knew, ever knew this, but while I was at AUC, Neil Wilson came up to Boston and spent a day trying to talk me into be president of Loma Linda University. Really? And I said that I had absolutely no sense of calling for that at all. I said, you need an MD for that, not, not, not somebody with my experience. I, I said that that's a health institution, you know? And I just, I don't, and he, he really worked me over. We had lunch, he talked to me in the morning, talked to me in the afternoon. He came up from Washington, D.C. To, to, to do this. And I said, absolutely not. And that's when he went to Lynn Barron's, and which was the right, the right decision. I mean, she was an MD. She, you know, this was her world and so forth. She did a great job there. Anyway, I, two or three late years later, uh, I uh, was invited to La Sierra. And um, I inherited an institution with multiple millions of dollars of debt and left it with a $100 million endowment. And not me alone, all of us working together, you know. And um, the, the, so physically, there was, it was satisfying at those institutions to build those and to build up the enrollment and so on. But more in terms of service, as I've been going through piles of stuff in my office trying to sort, like you, I've come across all these letters from past students and faculty thanking me for this I've done and for that I've done and so on. And you look back and you realize that you touch a lot of lives and you've made many things possible for people, you know? And so service is what it's all about. Yeah. You want God to use you where you can make a difference, right? And as you've said, I've tried to do that in the community as well, because I want the community to see the Adventists as a resource for the community. And so I did that both at AUC and here at La Sierra. And then, and it hasn't hurt me professionally because 
As you know, for four years, I was president of the American School of Oriental Research, which is the pinnacle for a, an academic in my field to be recognized by your, your colleagues in that way. So I've been blessed, and I know that it wouldn't have happened without the support and the privileges that the church has given me. So I'm very, very grateful to the church. And I've made mistakes, and I, I, I would certainly do various things differently, but overall, I'm, I'm thankful and feel, feel blessed and uh, very appreciative to the church. Amen. Well, having, having lived through a fair amount of that with you. Oh, yes, right. It, uh, it's been one of the highlights of my life. And who, I never thought that would come to me, but I, but I got to do that. And I got to do right. it with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I had your private line, how many times at midnight, <laughs> when I work stuff out. Right, right. We were the leaders of the two institutions. And uh, sometimes we had to just work, help each other out, work something right. out. We did it privately. Right. No one else knew right. about it. Right. And uh, it was a great run together. Larry. Well, I've, I've admired your devotion to duty and how hard you work to bring grace into people's lives, you know, and that's been a blessing to me. Well, thank you that our lives intersected and uh, thank you, Jim, that letting us uh, do this together next time you can make the interview. But uh, these were things we wanted to talk. We could, uh, we could go many other places still, Larry, if we had another sure. hour. Sure. But and I, I want to say that I, I really appreciated Jim Stad in the Middle East, too. You know, I saw him, uh, I wouldn't say under fire, but in some difficult situations. And he was somebody that, that I admired. I was a teenager then, you know. Yeah. So you have, you have a good heritage, Jim. Thank you. I think so. Yeah. Uh, say a prayer, Larry, for yeah. young pastors who were watching church administrators, friends of ours around the world, and just pray yeah. for the church, the leaders who are out there who are, so far I've been writing us little notes, thank, thanking us for it, Good. and I'll say a prayer for them. Good. Oh God, uh, this evening we uh, pause before we conclude this discussion to thank you for your leadership in the church and in its institutions and in its organizations. I thank you particularly for, uh, for uh, these two uh, uh, pastors, um, what they have done in their lives and in their ministries, and uh, the way they have reached out so many people uh, around the world. I pray that you will continue to give them success with this venture that they have taken on and the other things that they are doing. And we think too of how they are representative of your ministers and workers around the world, some in very difficult situations, people who are probably lonely and who wish they had more resources and wish they had more knowledge as to how to deal with certain things. So we know that all of us are dependent on you. We live, move, have our being, and can only be blessed as, uh, as you work through us. So bless these two pastors and their work and everyone else within the sound of our voice in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Larry. Appreciate nice you taking you. the time to be with us. Uh, we're just a little operation here, but uh, I enjoyed every minute of it and uh, we hope we can do another time somewhere in the cycle of things. Very so, good. Bye-bye. <laughs>